My name is Eric, and I have a, a neo-noir sort of weird thing I'm doing with Michael Kester today. And I'm terrified. Not as weird as the things people are doing with each other in the film Bound. That is <laughs> one of the films today. Oh, that's today. not weird. Come on. Uh, no, nothing weird about that. It's super fucking hip. And uh, Strangers on a Train. Yeah, uh, right. We're doing some films. Uh, that we're going to spoil them. Yes, spoilers. Yes, thank you. Uh, I should have let people know about chapters. So you can chapter <laughs> under the bound and through Strangers on a Train. And get to the end of the show. That's the path towards the end of our show today. The first thing I want to talk about with Bound is Lena Wachowski. Okay. So Wait, Lena Wachowski. So yes. I saw Bound. I yes. mean, m- unbeknownst to much of our audience, uh-huh. I watched the films. Yeah, you did. Um, there's a Larry uh-huh. and there's an Andy. Yes. Who's Lena? Lena is Larry. What? Uh, Lena is now Larry. Okay. So when we talked about The Matrix... I mentioned that these two are infamously known for the time being as the Wachowski brothers. Sure. Because they reached the height of their fame with The Matrix. Right. And Bound came first. Yeah, Bound Bound did their earlier film. Sure. But afterwards, they did V for Vendetta and Speed Racer. Right. Well, they produced V for Vendetta. The point is, we mentioned all that stuff and probably got it wrong as well on The Matrix uh, when we talked about that. What we didn't get to the bottom of was this weird thing right. where the Wachowski brothers do not give interviews. Uh-huh. And so the press may or may not have gotten angry with them and decided to make up this thing they could run in the tabloids about how one of them was having a sex change. Uh-huh. Now, you and I were interested in this just so much as we are interested in filmmakers. Right. And it's kind of a weird thing sure. about a filmmaker. Well, and, and I mean, especially talking about something like Bound, such a female-driven film, sure. if one of the directors has a sex change, that's going to lend a, some opinion into why films are and what sure. they're doing and the themes. I mean, knowing the directors is just, it's its a really good way to know why the films are and Absolutely. what they're doing with them. Yeah, and I feel like that would add a layer. It wouldn't necessarily inform anything. It would just sure. make it more complicated. Right. And I uh, love to just get in over my head. And you know what? Nobody emailed us about it. Okay. I, I reached out to the listeners and I said, uh, we don't really know anything about this sex change, whatever. Uh, email us. We'll figure stuff out. But, you know, I was kind of scared to take the word of anything on the Internet. And what everything seems to uh, seems to kind of be in agreement about the, the more valid sources is that Lena Wachowski, now known as Lena Wachowski, uh-huh. is male to female transgender. So was Larry Wachowski previously, and um, the fact that there's few kind of tabloid details for people to email about is probably a great thing because yeah. it means nobody's really worried about this. Uh, during you know the last couple of films that they've produced, they've been known as the Wachowskis, um, specifically the most recent one, or I guess that happened around Speed Racer, sure. actually, and. Uh, Larry had his name changed under the Directors Guild Association uh-huh. or whatever. So the DGA. So, I mean, has started identifying as a woman over the last decade or so. And if you see the pictures that are taken of the Wachowskis over time, you can definitely see the change that's taken place. There aren't a lot of pictures of the two sure. either. I mean, they basically like to let their movies kind of speak for themselves. Uh-huh. And they don't grant a lot of interviews. But for the few that have happened over the last 10 years, you can kind of, I mean, I see the photos now and I actually feel like really good for Lena. It's a weird thing because you see sort of these, um, it's hard to read into any of this because right. you, what do you know, right? I yeah. have, I've never met sure. these people. I don't know anything about them. But um, you see somebody just kind of grow into their skin over a matter of years. Yeah. And it's uh, it's just a, an interesting quirk, I guess. It's a weird thing. But the lack of info obviously means that, you know, she wants to keep to herself. And for as much as we can try and point to the movie and go, that's why X, Y, or Z happens. Sure. A fucking male to female transgender probably has interest in female issues. Yeah, exactly. I think that's about the most we can derive right. from that. So now going by Lena Wachowski, going by the Wachowskis rather than the Wachowski brothers... 
And that's really the most hard information that's available. Uh -huh. Until they write autobiographies, which will probably never right. happen, they don't seem interested in talking about their personal lives. So that's the most we're going to get out of that. Huh. We're also only going to get the shortest flying Tom Tom of all time. Yeah, I do like that for a segue. Tiny. Yeah, it's uh part of it. It almost just seems like another bit of the weird intro credit sequence. Thing, yeah, right. Where it's just tacked on on the very end, and you kind of don't know what you're looking at the whole fucking right. time. And then all of a sudden, a woman's hands are tied and up. Oh, forget about that. Yeah, Moving well, it says bound, scene. and then it's like hands are tied, and it's yep. like this is an example of bound. At first, you don't even think that's coming back. You think, here's an example of Bound. It's just the movie being abstract. Right. It's the girl with the dragon tattoo credits. Right. Did you ever see that movie? No. There's a bizarre, surreal credit sequence. Super fucking cool. 30 pin cables. Just weird stuff. Has nothing to do with the movie. Huh. What Bound is, and we've talked about Bound not only on the Matrix show, but on the Child's Play show. Yeah. On the, uh, with the Chucky movies. It's, um, I mean, foremost in my mind, not a Wachowski film, but a Jennifer Tilly film. Oh, yeah. It's because got, you don't get a lot of opportunities. It's a bad case of the Tillys. To, <laughs> yeah. A bad case of the Tillys. You know, when I use Tillys as a plural noun, I'm usually referring to something else. Me too, but... You don't get a lot of opportunities to think a Jennifer Tilly movie, especially yeah. not one as good as Bound. Well, no, I would, I, I'm going to argue with you there. I would yeah, say that so? of the three movies that come to mind when you think a jennifer tilly movie they're all great i like that answer <laughs> actually i'm gonna agree with you completely uh the movie is so fucking hot from the first scene yeah it is, it is. it's redid the elevator and uh all the music and the camera stuff it's all like um, it's sexy sexy fuck jazz the it really whole is former it portion is. of the yeah. film yeah it's uh it's neo-noir at its yeah. sexiest yeah it's just smoky and smooth, and it's all hips and curves. Well, the whole and Jennifer thing. Tilly's voice and drives Jen yeah. it. Well, the, my favorite thing about Jennifer Tilly's voice in this, and I went to show somebody this the other day because I was making a joke about how I was going to use Jennifer Tilly's sex noises as my ringtone, uh -huh. and then I decided I was going to use it as my alarm, and then I decided that might have a, an effect that I uh, wasn't intending. Uh -huh. So I'm going back to ringtone, but the point is, that uh, in looking for a clip from this movie, I found all of these Jennifer Tilly performances. And her voice varies quite a bit. Yeah. In the Child's Play stuff, it's squeakier, and that's always how I think about her voice. Sure. Like the cartoon kind of stuff. But that's because she's doing voice work. Right. She can also put on a really normal performance. She It kind of reminds me of um, Gilbert Godfrey in that yeah. way. Although sure. that's so mean to compare anybody's voice to Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> but if you've ever heard... Gilbert Godfrey do an impression. Sure. I believe I mentioned this during the Aristocrats. Uh -huh. He can have any fucking voice he wants. Yeah. He chooses to sound like Gilbert Godfrey. Fucking brilliant. Anyways, here it's whispery Jennifer Tilly. Yeah. It's phone sex Jennifer Tilly mm -hmm. the whole goddamn time. When Corky's working under the, uh, the sink to get the earring out, and it's just that whole, you know, the coffee scene. Sure. And I love the cameras under the sink. And you just see leg. Jennifer Tilly's leg you just leg. rut into the frame. Uh, so many of the scenes are composed of full shot of a character, Jennifer Tilly's legs. Right. Shot of a phone, Jennifer Tilly's legs. Right. Uh, the dress that, you know, just barely covers herself. All fucking leg, this woman. I just can't get enough. Sure. Uh, Jennifer Tilly. She's laying it on really thick with Corky. Uh -huh. I mean, really thick. And then she lays it on even worse. Yeah. You know what I mean? When they, uh, when that finally happens, there's yeah. this weird unspoken thing going on. And, uh, and then she says, oh, can't you tell I'm trying to seduce you? Right. You think it basically can't get any worse. Sure. She's fucking her with her tongue before she's actually fucking her with her tongue. Right. I'm impressed by how far, I mean, I bring all of this up, not because it's dirty, fun, naked uh -huh. Jennifer Tilly awesome, which is also why I'm bringing it up and it's double right. feature and. Rather than spread out the sexuality through an entire year, like last year, we're just going to do it all in the bound right. portion of this show. But I'm just impressed with the movie. And oh, yeah. just the, the fucking gravitas, is that the right yeah. word to use here? I was going to just say balls, but that's not well, what I'm impressed with. Well, you can't say balls and bound. I know, right? It's just not possible. You just, you think it's already pretty heavy, and then they're on the couch, and you realize that is nothing. By, that's Disney shit oh, yeah. by comparison. Uh, she nearly attacks her. Right? Yeah. I mean, she just fucking shoves her hand between her legs, and you're caught so off guard by how sexual it is. Uh -huh. It reminds me of when we talk about horror movies. Yeah. When we talk about uh, violence, something like Drive, and we talk about being caught off guard, maybe having an idea it might be violent. Sure. You know Bound's going to be a little sexual. 
my introduction to Bound was when they talked about it in Child's Play yeah. as being the right. Jennifer Tilly sex ha-ha movie, porn movie. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and so I was ready for that going in, but I was not ready for that going I, in. Mean, I agree with you. I had no idea what I Were was. Were you watching. caught off guard by it? Well, I I was. You seen Bound before no, this, by the way? Oh, no. so I've seen it a couple and times I, now. And I had still no idea off. what what I was watching. All I That's knew great. was that it was a fucking sexy lesbian film. Sure, sure. Um, but what I didn't realize is that the former portion of the film is just porn. Call in, I mean, seriously, call in the plumber. Sure. Oh, I know, if only right. there was some way I could pay you. Yeah, right. Maybe with do a you drink. Like, I mean, do you like coffee? Sure. I made a black coffee for you. Yeah, I, straight black. I thought that's yeah. how you'd like it. Yep. I mean, it is fucking a porno. Yeah. And it's it's all the parts of a porno that you think aren't sexy. It's sure. the setup <laughs> sure. to the fucking. It's the dialogue during the fucking. And the jazz. Right. This film proves that porn doesn't need sex to turn you on. There you go. It can turn you on with all of the elements of porn minus the fucking. Although, I mean, there is the fucking. Sure. Yeah, we There is also the fucking. Well, I like that it's... I leave this to me and the noir show to say this, I guess. I like that it's character development. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, I felt you rolling your eyes before I even said that. <laughs> it's not just let's tack on the porn to this violent sure. monster flick. I mean, this is really crucial to... This is when we're watching True Romance. Right. And rather than True Romance being, oh, let's go to a comic book store, samurai films, aren't we cute? It was kind of, oh, we're lesbians and we're going to be in this elevator and there's a sure. lot of sexual tension right. and that's what our relationship's made of. And it's also, and not to invoke the title, but I think it needs to be pointed out that the title is not just about ropes. Yeah, it's about being you. connected to somebody. And sure. it's about, you know, this is the moment where they, where the ties that bring them together as a crime duo yeah get formed i mean the uh corky says she needs to trust her partner and without this sort of intense attraction and this sort of serious devotion to each other i mean it comes up so quickly that if you don't believe it and it's not intense enough for you to feel it yeah you're not going to believe that they trust each other enough to pull sure. off this heist which by the way this is a heist movie <laughs> yeah also no that. one fucking told me that yeah. i was sitting there expecting an overt amount of sex and lesbians and then sex and lesbians falls by the wayside and turns out surprise heist yeah isn't that great well and so the other thing about the title bound is it's a reference to sadomasochism uh-huh. to you know that S and M sexual sure. relationship of being tied up right but you have, uh, when you were talking about it being the characters with one another, they have this kind of intentionally symbiotic relationship right. that they've agreed to form. This isn't a sort of codependency that you find yourself in that's unhealthy. Uh, some may still argue it's unhealthy, but I think it's wicked fucking cool. Two people have decided just devote themselves to each other entirely yeah. uh, to create that dependence sure. intentionally. It's like S and M, yeah. You know, in a, in a sexual sense, sure. it's that in in the sense of the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing about the sexuality of the pacing of the film, even because mm-hmm. so basically, I like to look at the film that they fuck twice. They fuck one way, Violet's way, and then they fuck Corky's way. Sure. Because remember, they're again they're talking in the truck about how a you know setting up the heist is like foreplay. I mean, it's sure. sex twice. Yeah. It's two different types of sex. And I don't know if you noticed this, and and maybe it was just me really reaching for more sexual imagery in the film. <laughs> sure. Um, not that that's a difficult task in Bound. No, that's no, really not. Um, but the film has afterglow. Interesting. Every time they fuck, the next scene, the one of the characters is really happy. The, so think about, I mean, the most obvious one. Violet and Corky have sex. Mm. And then the next scene, it's happy sunny day music and Corky's <laughs> getting out of her truck. Sure. And I mean, again, this is before I knew it was a heist movie. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, so now Corky's no longer a dismal criminal. She's, right. you know, found something to live for. And yay, the film has afterglow. But it keeps doing that. Yeah. Anytime somebody gets fucked in any aspect of the word, the next few minutes of the film are this afterglow. Yeah. Where it's the film is basking in the fucking. Sure. It's been released and now it's just a moment of clarity where it's trying to re you know reassess where it is in the sure. world. It happens with Caesar too. Mm-hmm. Whenever he gets fucked over, 
instead of immediately reacting, he goes, I need some time. I need yeah. some time. Yeah. And he sits there. He wants to cuddle afterwards. Sure. He's yeah. been fucked over. He wants to cuddle. Exactly. Yep. And he's sitting there and instead of immediately jumping into the next thing, he's yep. been fucked. I mean, yep. he is laying in bed bleeding sure. and he has to go, okay, where's my life right now? Yeah. I love that about it. I mean, there's nothing wrong just with sex and nudity for nudity's sake. Sure. But for the movie to be sex, it's decided that, all right, I'm going to do these bold things while I've taken a step. No one else is fucking willing to take. Sure. I'm also going to use that metaphorically and I'm right. going to use that yeah. as symbolism for other parts of the film and, you know, tie in these kind of parallels. Can I say tie in these kind oh, yeah. of parallels Absolutely. on the show? I think as many as many bound puns for this one as possible. As long as there's no jokes about scissoring, right? No, scissor me timbers. So you think the impression that the Chucky films gave you might have been a little, a oh, little it misleading? Oh, it was the Not most... Not quite the lifetime pornography you thought it would be? It was the most flawed representation of Bound anyone could have ever given me. Sure. So, uh, Seed of Chucky, Jennifer Tilly plays uh, a character, and she also plays... I mean, she's the voice of Tiffany. And there's a scene where they're on the phone and in the background the other jennifer tilly voiced character is screaming sure and the person on the other end of the phone goes i thought i heard you screaming and she says no i'm watching bound gina gershon <laughs> is fingering me yeah and right. so immediately my impression of bound is the movie where there's a lot of jennifer tilly getting fucked by a girl sure and yeah. it, the, where it's the type of movie where if you overhear it it sounds like someone's having sex they play with that a lot there's yeah. a lot of uh kind of audio stuff that they do and, you know, the sex isn't so vulgar on the screen. Actually, on mute, the sex is pretty tame. Oh, yeah. It's all the sound that's doing sure. that, you know. And the movie needs that to then play with that concept of sound later. Another thing they do, again, uh, another way to use the sex in this movie, is that uh, Caesar walks in on them and dismisses the cheating right. because it's a woman. Yeah. Immediately and, goes up. That's that's oh, not what I thought. So this brings me to a question I want to ask you regarding Corky. Do you think that it's unfair of the film to just give Corky a male character and have a woman play it? Do you think that that's an unfair role for a lesbian to just be like, well, Corky's the boy? I was often told that that happens with um, Jodie Foster movies. Yeah. I, that yeah, they write sure. them for men and then can, Jodie yeah, Foster comes I in and plays them. I was talking to some people about that the other day, and I made a joke that happens with uh, Mia Jovovich, but Golden Retrievers. Yeah. And then I went back through. <laughs> just, this is just a fun experiment. You can play this. And you and I both love Mia. But if you imagine her films with, like, uh, Air Bud sure. playing the titular role right. instead, it makes sense sure. in basically all of the films. Yeah, it does. Uh, from The Fifth Element to Resident Evil. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I've completely diverted from, from your question. That's a fine way to write that relationship. Sure. Well, I don't I think, know. What do I know about writing it? My favorite female characters are all written by men right. anyways. I yeah. don't know. I have no idea. I think a lot of the film plays with lesbianism way before you know this current rush of the gay rights thing. I mean, sure. lesbianism is still taboo. And it's, yeah. I mean, the film plays on it, and I'm not faulting it for it because it's absolutely allowed. It's a fucking piece of art. Sure. But the film plays on the fact that girls fucking girls is hotter than than a guy fucking a girl. Well, Caesar says, uh, what does he say to her about being a plumber? Uh, you must be good with your hands or something. Yeah. As if the film maybe didn't even get that that was a joke sure. when it did it. They just go straight for it and they never apologize. Right. And uh, you're right. At the time that came out, that was even more of a taboo yeah. than, you know, today. Sure. You know, the writing dynamic, though, it's, um, I can't really speak to how it represents women, not having women parts myself. Uh -huh. Although when you're claiming to represent, you know, 50% of the Earth's population. You're wrong. You probably can't. There, yes, there are two women somewhere that look and act just like Violet and Corky, uh -huh. right? Probably. So I'll buy that those are two characters. For me, it always comes down to, well, do you like those characters? Yeah. Do, I never watch Death Proof and go, do these girls actually exist somewhere? Sure. I just go, well, this is the story they're telling me. I like that or I don't uh -huh. like that. So I think the way that the script shines is in showing the relationship and showing, you know, the unconventional way that uh, they choose to define not only the relationship itself, but how it grows, how it evolves over time. Mm -hmm. When you see them um, going back to that idea of binding together of becoming more dependent on each other yeah corky gets mad at violet when that guy comes over she uh the the jealousy elevates the relationship over just a casual thing 
it's that jealousy that kind of shows, uh, you know, when she's questioning her about it, oh, it might not just be the plumber that comes over and fucks me when Caesar's not around. Right. That maybe this is becoming more important. And then sealing off the heist. I mean, when they decide to do that, that's the Thelma and Louise moment. Sure. That's the fucking yep. runaway moment. And then the whole crime half of the film happens. You know, there's uh, there's that parallel to sex you talked about where she says, I can fuck someone I just met, but to steal, I need, you know, to know someone like I know myself. Yeah. It's the further development of that relationship. And the film, once it realizes that, all right, if we are going to at least claim to be telling this character story, then it's time to shift into crime and heist and violence sure. and move away from sexual development. And it completely does that. Well, and it kind of does that in, I mean, there's, okay, so we haven't talked about the uh, glory and fault of the montage. We haven't okay. touched on it in a while because sure. we haven't had to. But honestly, yeah. I fucking love money cleaning montage in Bound when uh, Violet's discussing yeah. how meticulously oh Caesar God. is about cleaning the money yeah. and it shows him, you know, she's trying to live her life in this home and he's just, he's, I mean, he's an insane person, but it just shows um, his attention to detail. Sure. Right. He it's seems this, like the kind of person that should be able to notice his wife is right. fucking the plumber. Well, but you know, that's the thing is it shows two things. It shows that. And I think the reason he doesn't notice is because it's a woman and that yeah. immediately that the red flag goes down. Oh, sure. But the other thing that it clues in, but only retrospectively, he's crazy. Yeah, he's nuts. He's a crazy person. He washes and irons the fucking money. Yeah, he's he's nuts. a lunatic and he is so dedicated to the idea of getting himself in a position of light and safety mm -hmm. that he will absolutely, he doesn't sleep for three days because he's yeah. ironing and counting money. Well, it shows his commitment. It shows how hard this guy's going to be to completely fuck over. Right. He's their nemesis now, and you thought he was clueless. Yeah, you and thought he was... And then it shows I mean, this, and you go, oh, this is a formidable opponent He's like a six-inch six, six inch inseam away from a zoot suit. Yeah, there you when go. When he walks in the first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you just think he's kind of a buffoon and clownish. And then, you know, I mean, really, once the suit comes off and you see his real makeup and, like, sure. what he's made of and where his his loyalties lie sure and how i mean he's a he's a dog in a corner yeah you can't get around him you have to go through him sure it should be pointed out too while we continue to weave sexuality through the whole movie he's naked just as much as jennifer tilly yeah. i was just film. gonna say that that in the film you see just as much of his body as each naked character such a perfect treatment of nudity in this film i love everything about this movie you know as much as we always rip on montages you have to have montages in heist films. That's yeah. just the thing you have to sure. do. I didn't think it would be when laundering. Wow, laundering. When cleaning. the He's literally laundering yeah. the fucking money. <laughs> but that's where it's at. Some heist films are made so much better by their... My favorite, uh, what's now a cliche, it's almost a joke about heist films, is the, um, the montage of the heist film being described and then happening and you get to the end of the montage. And, and it wasn't the heist just is a, successful. Yeah, the heist has already gone down. Right. So we play with that idea in here, but that's part of their signature is this, you know, the Wachowskis themselves have a meticulous attention to detail. They like to show that in their character. You know, Violet points it out. She says, uh, all night long, I listen to that sound, the sound of money. Yeah. It's this fucking noir line. It's them going, embrace the genre, but also going, no, really, see, if, if you didn't get it from the montage, he's really washing money all goddamn night. And it's also showing their fixation on sound. Sure. So being not just the orgasm noises, the beautiful, wonderful, squeaky Tilly the whole time. Uh -huh. It's uh, all of these little sounds throughout the movie that get so much focus. I don't know. You know, we haven't done a lot of Wachowski stuff yet. I mean, now we've done two. So we have. Yeah. Once you do two, that's officially a lot. But do you see some of their signature here? Yeah, there's a lot of... Um... There's a lot of standoffs and a lot of characters framed in very imposing ways. Sure. And like, I mean, I've only seen The Matrix on this, so yeah, I'm sure. comparing this to The Matrix. That's all we've done on the show, and that's all that needs to be said as of right There's now. There's some more obvious ones where they do like a pan around a gun. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean... Yeah, you do get that, too. There are scenes in this where I watch it and I go, that's where The Matrix came from. Sure, sure. That shot began the matrix i think there's a, a fixation on objects too as well as sound that seems to be something they're kind of interested in you know the overhead lowering the bag of sure. money into the bucket or uh, lowering that briefcase into the frame 
when you get um, uh, that full frame shot of the gun and then even a further close up on the trigger. Yeah. Just kind of showing that fixation on mechanisms and that interest in uh, a lot of moving parts at once. I guess also being symbolic for what's happening sure. you know, in the movie. But that was also true of The Matrix is, uh, you know, delivering this kind of mind fuck and all of these different things going on and moving at once. Right. You look at something like Bound and we're showing you a trigger mechanism. We're showing you the physical items that play into the heist, kind of pulling back and talking about not even necessarily to be symbolic, but just to go, these are two people who write movies. They're interested in mechanisms. Sometimes those are very physical, real mm-hmm. mechanisms, and sometimes those are how do you orchestrate a heist. Right. I don't think one necessarily has to comment on the other. It's just that's the type of things we include in our movies because that's our personal interests. Yeah. Aside from the spinning matrix shot, though, you also get that kind of matrix shot of following the phone line with yeah. the camera. Yeah, we're just showing where it's that goes. following the phone line, and then it hits the loop, and that's sure. when you realize that it's really following the phone line. Sure. It's not just an excuse to show Jennifer Tilly's legs once right. again. There's a, a few of the slow motion shots, but the uh, I, that great shot of red on white, you know, the blood in the paints. Another way people can show red mm-hmm. on white in their movies. Uh, the interrogation scene, too. Directly, you know, there being oh, another yeah. one of those sure. uh, when we talked about The Matrix. But that scene is so, I mean, you do not forget. It's got a hook to it. You know, it has a... Uh, it begins with the blood in the toilet. So well, it begins already... with the other toilet vibrating. Sure, sure. Which is really a fucked up idea. Sure. Plumbing imagery as well, <laughs> just throughout the movie. Yeah. You know, you juxtapose that back and forth with Corky working. It's a weird enough scene you're trying to get hints, and then you start to hear the sounds, and you start thinking sex, because that's what the movie's playing with. It's going, oh, sex sounds. And then you see the other room, and it's this guy just being fucking beaten to death. So they take uh, the garden shears or whatever, and they say this thing to him that's so fantastic. It's one of the best lines in the movie. It's, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you 10 times. That seems like a weird number. That's yeah. a lot of time. That's not very sure. threatening, right? right? I'll count to three is threatening. Uh, I'm going to ask you this question. You have 10 chances to get it yeah. right. But then when they show the fingers, you fucking get it. Yeah. You and realize, just, oh, he has 10. Oh, I see what <laughs> right. you did there. Violence through imagery for even the characters sure. are using imagery uh, through the dialogue just makes it seem so much yeah. more brutal. Corky herself is absent through most of the third act. Uh huh. I kind of feel like that's, uh, that's becoming a Wachowski thing, too. It's not unusual for yeah. them. It seems like a weird thing to do, especially in a movie you have about primarily these two characters, if not these three characters. And one of them vanishes for the uh, the entire end of the film, just misses out. Violet's never been involved in a heist. She's never right. been involved in a robbery. Sure. And then it comes down to her dedication. Yeah. It comes down to her ability because we're already kind of convinced that Corky is in. She knows what she's doing. Well, and she's done this before. And she's involved. Like yeah. she is dedicated to Violet. There's sure. really no question by this point in the film that if anybody is going to turn on the other, it would be Violet turning on Corky. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so we have Violet in the position for the remainder of the film or for a large portion of it to pull the plug on the whole thing, take the money for herself and fuck Corky over. Yeah. So we get her tied up because her role in the film is over Mm -hmm. and uh, you stay in this room and now it's Jennifer Tilly's turn to do her part of the heist. The thing that I really like about this is you get to see Violet being the brains. Mm -hmm. You know, up to this point, Corky could have been propping her up. Corky could have really been running the entire show. And now you start to see Violet and the power struggle with Caesar. You see that uh, that phone call phone she call. makes from yeah. the bathroom. I mean, that's the real moment where I go, not just a good, you know, Violet herself, not just a good actress. Not able just to a drop nice pair a, of legs. Yeah, drop a <laughs> bottle of wine or whatever. You know, sure. she can do that stuff. But to be able to think on the fly like that, to go, uh, I'm going to listen to this conversation from the bathroom. How do I get the upper hand? I see this moment where he's fucked. All right, now is, you know, now's the time that... Uh, I execute this last step here and they're not even in the same room and she fucking power plays him. It's beautiful. It shows how calculating she is, which goes back to a lot of the noir element of the movie, that cold calculating female. In this case, being neo-noir, having a perfect turn on the usual staples of the genre, this is a woman who's out to rob the money for herself, but she's the closest thing we have to a heroine in the film. She is someone who's doing this to get out of the game, you know, 
uh, which is goes back to the classic bank heist thing too, I guess, of one more job to get out of the game. She's yeah. going to fuck over her husband, who does not care about her at all, take the money, and run away with Corky. So we're rooting for her, and now she's showing how she can be cunning and take that usual femme fatale kind of thing to get the upper hand here. Right. I should also say, I feel like there's more to Jennifer Tilly. That's why this oh, yeah. is one of my favorite roles for her. She's great in the Chucky stuff. Don't get me wrong. Sure. I love her in that. But she's comedy. Uh-huh. You know, and to see her in this, I mean, I take so much joy in those moments where you're seeing that Caesar is two steps ahead, mm-hmm. but that just puts him two steps further into her ploy. Right. It's like in another scenario, this is the guy who would totally be on top of things before you even knew they were coming. Sure. It's just she set up such a great trap that you're just seeing him fall into it that much faster, fail that much harder. You know, that scene where he says, oh, that's what Johnny wanted. He wanted me to deliver the briefcase. Right. He jumps to this conclusion she might not have even anticipated because of how well of a, a plan they've laid. I like the the Jennifer Tilly role because of how much they give her to do with her character and how perfect she is at all of it. Sure. I would not rather see anybody in this role than her. She hits every note of it. She adds so much to it. The other places I've seen her succeed, she's playing comedic roles. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes she plays the bimbo. I mean, that's even kind of her character in the child's play stuff. I try and think of it as something so much different, but I think most people probably see those movies and think, oh yeah, she's the bimbo. They make a lot of jokes at her expense and at the expense of her career. You know, that's bullets over Broadway too, is the same kind of thing, making fun of her as the bimbo. And working against the typecasting here, is so much of what I think surprises me about Violet's ability to get the upper hand. Mm -hmm. It actually works in her favor, the fact she's usually typecast. All right, don't be terrified, but it's film noir time. Okay, so Strangers on a Train is apparently maybe a film noir. But the other thing that we've already covered on the show with also being scary about Strangers on a Train is that it's Hitchcock. Yeah. And if I know anything about anything on Double Feature, it's that really nothing's scary as long as we throw our hands up and go, I don't really know what this is, but sure. I know how I feel about it. Sure. That's what I'm going to be doing for the remainder of oh, today's Strangers show. on a Train. Beautiful. Well, so this would be our third uh, Hitchcock movie, I believe. Sure. We, we did, did Psycho, Psycho first. And we mm. did Rear Window. Oh, man. Our fourth, we also did The Wrong Man. Oh, that's right. But we're all over this Hitchcock thing. Okay. Totally yeah, we got, got this, this in the bag. Raymond Chandler might be the only other thing that's kind of scary on uh-huh. today's show. Raymond Chandler didn't actually write this movie, oh. but he's a, he's a name that's in the credits as having uh-huh. written it, which is a weird thing. He's the guy who wrote Double Indemnity, okay. and he wrote a lot of film noir stuff. He's got a good body of work. He wrote a draft of this movie, or what was going to be the script, and I guess he and Hitchcock hated each other, didn't get along. <laughs> um, Hitchcock was kind of notorious for that, you know, big name director, big celebrity type of director. And had a strong personality to him. Sure. So Warner Brothers wanted to keep Chandler's name on it anyways, because he's a big noir sure. guy and it's Yeah, it's a name. It helps their movie a lot. But he didn't actually write a fucking word, according to the other people who worked on the movie, of what ends up in the final draft. But the story maybe, right? Um The title? I don't think he wrote anything. Wow. I think I think maybe even <laughs> just out of spite, uh, Hitchcock might have thrown out every tiny contribution he made. That's hilarious. So instead we have a movie, it's so funny we were just talking about this in Bound, but we have a movie written by women. Uh huh. By one woman in particular, um, Zenzi Ormond, I think is how you pronounce her name. Okay. Uh, but also worked really closely with Hitchcock's wife, uh-huh. Alma, worked uh, closely with their producer as well, Barbara Kean, to make the final draft of the movie to get it in in time to start finishing this after all of these production delays. So here's the most obvious thing we can look at. If we're going to call this a film noir, then we got to talk about femme fatales. Sure. Because I like women, double feature love feminism. Uh-huh. We just, it's a thing we do. So I know what a femme fatale is. I'm aware of at least some of the more surface aspects of film noir. Femme some fatale. Some people might not. Blinds, hats, yeah. <laughs> gum shoes. Yeah, right. Well, so femme fatale, I think it's it's one of uh, our favorite dynamics on the show oh, because yeah. it holds up women. It gives them this position of power. Oh, yeah. Um, it gives the actors something more interesting to do than the roles they were right. given well, in it's, cinema before. It's a role of power to fault. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the moment where you self-diagnose the level of power you have sure. and then use that to manipulate other people. Yeah. I mean, am I right? Yeah, it's, well, still... it's empowerment through feeling empowered, yeah, basically. Right, exactly. You decide, I'm going to be a powerful female. That's going to be my strength. Yeah. 
There's nothing yeah. that it's not like you're naturally stronger right. than the other exactly. females or something. You've right. just decided to be the empowered exactly. one. Exactly. And you dominate the romantic female roles right. that are littered through sure. the rest of uh both your movie and the rest of cinema history. Yeah. It's also uh you know, it's kind of it's the evil character, it's the flawed character, it's the the strength is also the weakness, and it always opens these great doors for mm-hmm. um various women throughout the years to have played. I don't know if we have a femme fatale in Strangers on a Train, though. I think it may be completely uh, devoid of that archetype. You know, there's really not that many characters in the film. Sure. Um, and the female characters, I mean, they're either dying or terrified. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go with no femme fatale. Well, Miriam's the most conniving one. You know, his wife. Uh, she would have fit right in and bound. Yeah. She's conniving because she's the wife who's trying to keep their marriage together. Right. right? She won't let him get a divorce. That's the femme fatale. I mean, there really isn't one. So, you know, you have to be careful when you kind of look at film noir not to go, oh, this is a film noir. Where's the femme fatale? Let's right. try and find it. The game here is really, where's the Hitchcock? Let's try and yeah. find it. Not in the physical sense that you always sure. play spot the spot the cock, I guess. Is. Spot the cock, yeah. Find the spotted cock. Just always have to take it one step further, don't you? Yeah. You just can't let it go. Can't let go of the cock. Never. Cock is always in my hand. But what I was talking about is finding these Hitchcock motifs, yeah. finding his general themes throughout the movies, and kind of looking at how does a story lend itself to those particular themes, or mm-hmm. why uh, the the narrative is happening in combination with the different bag of things that Hitchcock liked to do. Yeah. I mean, one thing that we've definitely talked about before in The Wrong Man, and just as a side note on a lot of the Hitchcock stuff, is that he likes to frame... He likes the noir double cross. I mean, that's what sure. lends the the noir sure. genre to, you know, his stuff. If you call it noir, you do it because of the double crosses, because of the setting up the innocent. And we've never really taken a look at that construct of right. setting up the innocent. Well, we talked about why he's drawn to those stories. Yeah. Being uh, the way he feels about police and sure. his background. But we didn't really talk about why that works. Right. Why the wrongly accused is something that mm-hmm. can get used in suspense to create tension and works so fucking well all the time. It's one of my favorite ways to create suspense, and it's one that really works on me personally. And I think a lot of people, because humanity is good, I think it says something great about it's a humanistic thing. Most people are innocent. Most people don't do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So these movies, these heist films where people go out and rob a bank and then, oh no, they might get caught. uh, Who cares? Yeah. I'm not going to rob a bank. I'm not afraid of that. I mean, I love these films. Don't get, we've, that's every other movie on double feature. People are going to get caught because they did something wrong. Right. But you don't have to do something wrong to get caught. That's what Hitchcock is trying to. He's saying, sure. oh, you always thought you were safe because you're a good person. Yeah. Turns out good people can get totally fucked over and there's nothing you can do right. about it. And so it's as if he has this idea about humanity, this humanistic idea that most people are good. They make the right choices. They operate morally. And I want to terrify those people. I want yeah. to terrify most people. And he was a success as a director. One of the greatest successes in cinema history which I think you might just extrapolate if you so chose to, Uh to mean that he was right and most of humanity's great and they don't worry about what would happen if they were in a crime. They worry a lot more about what if I met a guy on a train and through a simple conversation, he decided (laughs) to murder someone in my life and frame me for it. Right. Well, and the other thing that he also plays on a lot of, and it, I mean, it starts on the train while Mm -hmm. he's talking to Bruno. I mean, it all starts with a little foot tap. He really likes to play into the the romantic allure of murder sure i mean maybe not so much in the films we've done there's always murder but if you look at something like rope yeah where it's about the edges of the human experience it's sure. about the idea of a perfect murder and the idea of you know even an innocent man is only so close sure to becoming an evil man or right. becoming you know a killer and I mean, that's a lot of what Bruno's character is. Oh and, yeah. That's his charm, man. And they, they start, the whole film starts with these, I mean, the film rides on these little moments of minutia. Mm. And like I said, it starts with a foot tap Yeah. and then this conversation begins. And if only that hadn't happened, maybe none sure. of strangers on a train would have happened. Yeah. But instead it does. And we get into this deep conversation about murder and about 
you know, experiencing all there is to life. Sure. What does he say? He says, do everything before you die. Sure. It's pretty obvious. I think everybody kind of fundamentally agrees, live life to the fullest, right? Sure. But that's sure. not what he's saying. No, he doesn't. It's that on overdrive. It's yeah. do everything before you die. And he talks about, you know, doing all this stuff. But I mean, it includes things like murder. I get this feeling that I'm confident in Bruno as a murderer, but yeah. I do not feel that he has ever murdered before. Right. You know? Exactly. You feel like he's on top of this just because he's embracing it as, sure. oh, a fun thing that well, I can check off my list. Doesn't? Yeah. I was just going to say, doesn't it feel like a bucket list? It does. It Murder's feels... just one item. Yeah. He's doing the Pilkington thing. Sure. He's saying this week, uh, I'm going to take a train across the country and murder people. Right. I think they left that episode out. Bruno says a lot of interesting things. Yeah. He uh he says he admires people who do things. Yeah. You know, that's talking about that same thing. But he also says my theory is everyone is a potential murderer. Yeah. And that's when uh you know, it's the antithesis of humanism. Sure. I believe that nobody's a born murderer. Nobody yeah, I has agree. that in their blood or in their DNA. Yeah. I don't feel like anyone's genetically predisposed to that. Although the science might prove me wrong. And sure. if it does, that's fine and I'm completely wrong. It's weird, though, that we get that. We get that humanism of scare the audience, thrill sure. the audience uh, with murder. And then we get that anti-humanism of, right. hey, live life to your fullest. Everybody's behind that and kill each other. Uh, right after Bruno commits the murder, mm -hmm. he helps the blind man across the street. <laughs> sure. sure. Uh, it's like this moment where... It's again, he's not just a murderer. He's not. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, it's... If a it's, murderer at all. Exactly. He's not. He's a human being. And this is just a thing he did. It's not... It's the the intention is solely for the experience. Sure, sure. It's not some deep rooted hate in mankind or some you know need to get this rage out. It's to check it off the list. Yeah, and I feel like the movie has a great sense of who that character is, but does not shy away from how horrifying murder is. Agreed. Which yeah. is why I think ultimately it's a humanistic film yeah. because it treats murder like it's heavy, even if it's not coming from that character. Hitchcock uh, made these movies about murder, but he's not really known as a horror director. Mm. You know, he did Psycho and the Birds and whatever. But I think suspense is, is yeah, where suspense he falls is pretty far comfortably. More sure. Well, of the movies we've done, things like Rear Window, I mean, that's when I imagine Hitchcock in his finest moments, mm. Rear Window. Uh, Strangers on a Train, you know, this film still has its horrific moments when it calls for them. Things like murder, really just murder. That's when stuff yeah. is dark, when it's heavy. Uh, I don't know if the Tunnel of Love has ever been romantic. I yeah. think it's always just terrifying. But you have that silhouette scene in there. Yeah. And that goes to the um, the murder, this unsettling, unsettling like it should be, like a humanist would treat murder. But this unsettling scene of it's just quiet and no one else is around. You're at this carnival, which is also a noir thing, I guess. It's this weird nightmare alley kind of, you just see carnivals pop up in mm. noir. I don't know what that's about. But um, the character is off on her own, and she's strangled. And then you also get that shot, that uh, really famous Hitchcock shot of the reflection in the glasses, and then them just kind of sitting there. The, the moment itself is very cold and very lonely. It's weird in opposition to things like the tennis scene, which is another thing I think is right. iconic from this movie. Of everybody turning their head left to right, yeah, left to right, you except see the for killer, Bruno. just yeah, just staring straight forward. Well, and that's that's uh, something that I thought was really. I mean, I know it's not supposed to be hilarious, but no, because it's, it's, it is funny. it's double it feature. Is. Yeah, there's a whole point of the film starting right as Bruno is setting up to kill. Sure, I it, it spot the Bruno. I mean, yeah. You, yeah. you know he's around. Well, from the moment he meets Guy, he's. It reminds me of when we saw Penn and Teller get killed. The idea of the ultimate fan, you yeah. know, when we were watching that movie, it's the, this guy who knows everything from TV appearances or whatever. So Guy is a, a professional tennis player, and Bruno's been reading everything from the papers. And there's something offsetting about how much he knows him, especially for a guy who says, well, I don't really read the papers or whatever. But there's, a, there's something a little Norman Bates about him. There's this kind yeah. of southern gentleman mama's boy thing, and it manages to be... I mean, it's a perfect Hitchcock character like sure. Bates was, uh, just unassuming because he's gentlemanly and he's nice and he's got this enthusiastic, I love life kind of smile right. and he shows up and watches tennis. Friendly with old women. But yeah, exactly. Helps people cross streets. 
But at the same time, he commits murder, and there's something off about him, and he shows up, and he watches tennis, which I guess is also creepy, yeah. in addition to being exciting. It's childish, and it's fun for him. He's going around this party asking you know, those women about the perfect murder, an idea that they can entertain. Well, how do you create the perfect murder? How would you do this? You should, I mean, this is an actual great thing to do at a party is play thought experiments. Mm -hmm. If you can, anytime I'm at a social gathering and it's super awkward, I pride myself in being able to, uh, to converse with people when I don't know anything about them by asking hypotheticals. It's a lot of my fun moments on this show when you and I talk about hypothetical situations. To throw out something, I mean, murder is such a macabre one, but yeah. it's still a good example. How would you create the perfect murder? Sure. How do you uh, set this up, orchestrate it? It's the way that he, uh, I mean, you get people doing creative riffing. So you learn about them that way and you kind of see how their mind works. That's what makes this exercise interesting. Mm-hmm. This is the aristocrats thing. It's the jazz thing. It's here is a formula. Anyone can do this. What does yours look like? Right. The thing that makes him creepy about that isn't so much going around asking people about the perfect murder, but the fact that he critiques their murder in such you know specific and very serious ways. Mm-hmm. A normal person would play this game at a party with a bit of suspension of disbelief, but uh, he really, it's like he's taking notes. Sure. A little freaky, just a little bit. Well, I think he's trying to lead them into explaining his murder as the perfect one. Sure. I think he's trying he to the lead them to go and say, well, strangle them, but, you know, strangle somebody else's target and then, sure. and then have him just be like, yeah, that would be the perfect murder, wouldn't it? Yeah, right. <sighs> yeah, he, uh, he wants to know that in living his life to the fullest, he has done his one task in this particular case as well as he possibly could have. So I'm always torn when we do heavy movies like this because there's all of the stuff behind a movie like Strangers on a Train, and then there's all these things I want to ask you about. Uh Anybody who critically looks at this movie is going to want to talk about kind of good and evil, the doubles thing, the doppelganger thing. I mean, there's uh, there's this motif of twins and the fact that Bruno is kind of the bizarro version of Guy, and the movie plays a lot with pairs. And I don't want to cover that a whole lot because I do want to get to this other stuff, but... You know, there's a lot of plays on the word double. Uh, The scene we keep mentioning finding Hitchcock in these movies, Mm -hmm. he's bringing a fucking double bass onto the bus, you know? There's that thing that Bruno says he orders double drinks, uh, the only kind of doubles he plays. You know, it's a tennis joke, but it's also a joke about how the movie's going to cut back and forth between the two of them. It's always going to show what one guy's doing and another guy's doing as a reaction. You mentioned the foot tap. Right. I mean, that being that same kind of thing where we're showing, you know, this movie has a strange concentration on their feet all the time. And, you know, you think that's where things really begin, where I look at the movie and I go, all right, he decides to take that drink. That was, it's essentially his agreement to humor Bruno, his agreement to be his double. I think that is one of the last moments where he could bail. Right. I guess there's a couple different moments. But that seals in the deal in my head because after that, I kind of start to ask these questions about what is his involvement in the murder? Mm -hmm. How much is he responsible for, if anything? You know, after his wife is murdered, Bruno makes the case that Guy is just as responsible Mm -hmm. as Bruno is. And obviously, I think that's crazy. But do you think Guy bears any of the responsibility? Or you is can it all talk Bruno? about murder a lot without doing anything wrong. I think that's you true. can talk that's the about the party thing, right? Right. We yeah. wouldn't be doing anything wrong. I mm-hmm. just urge all our listeners to go do that. Sure. You can talk about murder for days, for years. Mm-hmm. As long as you don't kill them and you don't like do anything weird to them sure. that they're not okay with, you haven't done anything wrong. All right. So by humoring the conversation, yeah. maybe he's not doing anything wrong. But what about uh, the fact he had the conversation, didn't do anything about it? I mean, he could have called the police earlier, right? Yeah, but I mean... Does he have an obligation to go, that guy was weird, I should call the police? Think about what you just said when you said uh, talking about murder is macabre, but it's the perfect way. I mean, they might think you're weird. Do you expect they ought to call the police on you because they're not... They're a little shocked that you would be talking about murder? I see what you're saying. I mean, no one's committing any crime at that point. When you find out she's killed, though, that's where the the morality, the kind of moral questions start to come back with Guy. Because now something has happened. There's been an event. And while he maybe couldn't see this coming or didn't have any moral uh, obligation to do anything about it, he can react in a variety of ways now. He has some information regarding this guy. So when you find out she's killed, I mean, I mean, what do you do about that? Your wife's been killed. You know who did it. 
he's going to try and frame you for the murder in exactly would, the same way as the So, film. I mean, I'm the type of person that despite all this horrendous shit you hear about the, you know, the judicial system and the police and whatever, I'm always going to err on the side of, I didn't do anything wrong. The sure. judicial system will prove that. Right. So I'll call them in on this situation. Then again, you get something like Poughkeepsie tapes. Well, you know, I wouldn't be the type of person who would unflinchingly like disregard a plea bargain because sure. of my own pride. Sure. But I, I you kind of play their game. Right? Yeah. You're playing their game. But I certainly wouldn't hesitate to, you know, try to bring in the authorities to stop a murder at the risk of me being inconvenienced by trials for sure. a few months. I think about the judicial system a little differently. I don't have a lot of faith in it. I don't think. Right. I mean, I don't, it's a, it's a big unknown to me. I feel like it's, it's flawed certainly, mm. but it's the percentages are still in my favor. Sure. Well, and he's already in a lie uh, at the point where, you know, he finds out she was killed and he goes back to the family. He knew about the murder before the family told him. And then he had to pretend he didn't know. Right. So even at that point, uh, he's not going to the police. Sure. And, you know, I, I guess I'm the same way you are. I'm a fan of that transparency. I mean, let's say we went back through this movie and, you know, we had been completely transparent at every single moment. Ultimately, what's the worst consequence of that? Trials. I mean, maybe. That's it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not Trials, like... maybe, you know, an accessory charge, yeah. which would be maybe time, maybe a fine, depending sure. on... I mean, you're really not that guilty. Well, and there's the other side, too. If you're completely transparent, maybe you go to trial, maybe you don't, people believe you, people don't, but it's not just a pros and cons list of that. By not being transparent, that also means there's a killer running around. Right, exactly. It means uh, this isn't just a question of will he be free himself? Right, that, Is yeah. guy going to be convicted? There's a reason we put these people in jail. Yeah. And it's not just to punish them so we feel better. It's so that they're not on the street actually killing other people. Right. The website for this very show is doublefeatureshow.com. That's why show is in the name of the web oh, okay. show, so site show. I get that show, now. Show. And the email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Okay. If you want to uh, send us answers to any of these thought-provoking questions, I want to hear your uh, party story questions. I want to hear your... Uh sexual noises just in an audio file Oh man that would be great if people could oh this could get creepy fast i'm still gonna urge people to do it we have two more movies on the show next time uh-huh we're gonna do iron giant and my neighbor totoro watch more fucking film bye